Well, welcome everyone. I hope you've been having a great morning um, or afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Laura and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a member of the event organizing team and a moderator for this session. Um, I wanna make everyone aware that live transcription is available. Um, if you go to the bottom menu on your Zoom and click the button uh, that says subtitles, uh, we do have live transcription available. Uh, as well as our incredible ASL interpreters here. So in dreaming of this event, our team was inspired by words adopted from Project NIA. Abolitionist futures are not compatible with white supremacy, settler colonialism, misogyny, heterosexism, transphobia, ableism, and classism. Yet these systems of oppression are all around us and affect even this event space. The hope our team has for this session is that organizers, presenters, and participants, particularly those of us who carry a lot of privilege, are mindful of the differential impacts of power and have the courage to hold to account anyone here who exercises power in a way that enacts harm. If one of our organizers does remove you from this session, our intention is not to punish nor to exclude you, but to practice care for the abolitionist community we are building. So today I'm very excited to introduce Alex Vitali. Uh, Alex is a professor of sociology and coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College and a visiting professor at London South Bank University. He has spent the last 30 years writing about policing and consults both police departments and human rights organizations internationally. Professor Vitali is the author of City of Disorder, How the Quality of Life Campaign Transformed New York Politics and the End of Policing. His academy writings on policing have appeared in Policing and Society, Police Practice and Research, Mobilization, and Contemporary Sociology. He is also a frequent essayist whose writings have been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, The Nation, Vice News, Fortune, and USA Today. He has also appeared on CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, NPR, PBS, Democracy Now!, and The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. So I'm pleased to announce Alex Vitali. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thanks to everyone for inviting me to be a part of this uh, tremendously important and timely gathering. I was able to tune in briefly earlier today and I'm, I'm hoping to tune in to more of the conversations as the as the gathering continues. We're having a moment in the face of the horrible brutality of policing and the ongoing brutality of our system of mass incarceration, we're seeing effective resistance. The so-called defund the police movement is winning significant victories and I believe is well posed well positioned to continue that process of both concretely redirecting police resources into communities, but also in the process undermining the ideological foundations of mass incarceration and intensive invasive policing by establishing a counter narrative rooted in care, compassion, and solidarity rather than coercion, control, and punishment. Now, one of the canards that's been used to try to discredit this movement is to say that it doesn't have an answer to violence. This is always framed as a kind of gotcha moment in which some scenario of extreme violence has occurred. And now, what do you do if there are no police? Establishment pundits like Matt Inglesias claim that if we don't have an ironclad strategy to erase all violence, then the whole critique of over-policing is canceled. Despite the fact that when pressed, he admits that much of what police do could actually be replaced by other interventions. Even President Obama, who has been steadfastly opposed to our movements recently this week, stated that we need a complete rethink on why we're asking police to do all the things that they do. Hardly a statement of abolition, but certainly an acknowledgement of the victories we're making in changing the terrain of the conversation about community safety and community empowerment. 
Even police researchers like David Kennedy and Thomas Apt, who know that most policing doesn't work, continue to insist that we couldn't possibly defund the police and must instead continue to kowtow to the supremacy of policing because they insist it's the most important part of any effort to respond to violence. Much of this noise is politically motivated and even financially self-serving. These researchers and consultants get funding from the Department of Justice and major foundations looking to restore public trust in the police and our criminal legal system. Many of them also receive millions of dollars from police departments and high-tech companies that do business with the police, like Axon, the manufacturers of tasers. The advisory board of NYU's policing project, for instance, is made up of half police commanders plus surveillance tech executives and representatives of deeply conservative think tanks, all of whom are committed to this false narrative of police reform as a way of deflecting our much more substantive and concrete engage, uh, demands about reducing the scope and intensity of policing and working, to, working towards a world without police and prisons. We must, of course, be concerned, though, about violence. While serious crime is near record lows after 25 years of consistent declines, the US remains an incredibly violent country. And that violence is heavily concentrated among men in the most disadvantaged communities and typically enacted by those who have been the most abandoned by the defunding of communities. It is, in fact, a social and racial justice imperative that we do something about this violence. And of course, the people leading this movement for alternatives to policing are motivate, motivated by this exact concern. They're mostly women of color like Kayla Reed and St. Louis, Mariam Kava, Derricka Purnell, who have witnessed and experienced violence and are demanding better solutions than sending armed police to take a report or, or throwing some human being into a cage after the damage has already been done. I want to talk about three ways that we should rethink this conversation about violence to reframe the conversation and concretely address it at the same time. The first is to call into question this very framing of the issue that conservative pundits and, and their moderate allies engage in. What we call violent crime is actually only a small subset of the bodily harms inflicted on vulnerable communities predatory lending, environmental pollution, inadequate health care and nutrition, and yes, police violence are all sources of profound harm that reduce life expectancy and the everyday quality of life of those impacted by it. Zach Norris in his book, We Keep Us Safe, lays this out poignantly with his description of the deep suffering of individuals in black communities who have been failed by the child welfare system, subjected to env environmental contamination and denied access to safe, stable employment and housing. In an excellent research article, David Correa describes how landlords in Baltimore have been given a pass on generations of harmful lead poisoning and exploitative rental agreements but when tenants miss a rent payment or are deemed noisy or disruptive or engage in black market commerce or survive, they are immediately and intensively criminalized. It turns out the state and the police are only interested in a small subset of harms inflicted on poor people. And even then, their role has historically been one of managing these harms rather than truly preventing them. What this has meant is that too often harms experienced in, in poor, especially non-white communities were largely overlooked, as long as they didn't spill over into better off areas or interfere with larger economic and political concerns. 
For decades, police actually enabled harms in such places by either turning a blind eye to their needs or encouraging the concentration of black market activity like drugs, gambling, and sex work that were often controls by, controlled by organized criminal enterprises that regularly engaged in violence as part of their work and contributed to an insecure environment that led to the defensive carrying of weapons. Simon Balto, in his history of the Chicago police, provides extensive details on how this was enacted in the south side of Chicago and rested on a system of police bribery, corruption, extortion, and violence. Second, police control of violence is not very successful, in part because it isn't really designed to be. While many police officers believe that what they are doing is working to make communities safe by putting away the bad guys, what they are really doing is keeping a lid on social problems so that political and economic elites can continue to plunder the economy. Through processes like neoliberal austerity, politicians cut services and government sector wages and then incentivize already successful economic actors through tax breaks, subsidies, and deregulation in exchange for campaign contributions, and in the hope that some of their newfound taxpayer-funded wealth will trickle down to the rest of us. But that's not what's happened. Instead, as I show in my previous book, City of Disorder, this has produced wild inequalities in housing and labor markets and the dismantling of the social safety net. The result has been mass homelessness, mass untreated mental health and substance abuse problems, failed schools, splintered families, mass involvement in black markets of drugs, sex work, and stolen goods, due to profound economic insecurity. And then these problems, including the violence that inevitably goes along with them, are turned over to the police to manage, not to solve, but to manage, so that politicians can continue to make their downtown real estate deals without, without having to worry too much about either homeless people sleeping in their doorways or, or armed robberies outside their favorite restaurants and an uptick in homicides in poor, isolated communities of color typically are only a concern when they become front page news and, and interfere with the city's redevelopment plans. The fact is that policing is a reactive re enterprise that gives the appearance of doing something after the damage has already been done. They take reports and sometimes find perpetrators, but almost never actually protect someone facing imminent harm. Studies of police 911 responses show that police almost never arrive in time to prevent an act of violence. Most calls don't even go into the 911 system until after the violence has already happened and the perpetrator has left. Even when police successfully arrest someone, this does little to address the underlying social dynamics that are producing the violence. Police clearance rates for homicides hover around 60% and even fewer result in convictions. And the Vera Institute of Justice estimates that police only solve about 10% of all serious crime, most of which is never even reported to the police. It, <coughs> excuse me, in recent years, professional police apologists have trotted out a few studies that claim to show that certain specific police interventions can reduce the violence. They argue that things like hotspot policing and focused deterrence initiatives have some evidence to support their ability to achieve small improvements in crime rates for short to medium term time periods. And while there is much to criticize about these studies, even if we take them at face value, they're hardly sufficient to make the case for police-led violence reduction. Apologists use flawed studies to argue that more and more police equal more and more safety. 
but this assumes a kind of infinite elasticity to these interventions. Well, if 50 additional police helped, 500 more police will be 10 times as good. But this just isn't how the world works. And some of the authors of the papers that are being used to promote this viewpoint have actively criticized this misuse of their research, but often to no avail. Let's look at some of the studies that Iglesias and others cite in their takedown of this movement. They claim that, quote, there's a substantial literature in economics and socio sociology argu arguing that more police on the beat equals less violent crime, unquote. This evident lo evidence looks compelling because Iglesias calls out only the sub portions of studies that match his claim and even then inaccurately. When portions of the study affirm the null hypothesis, more police on the beat equals no effect on crime, they ignore it. Take for example, the first bullet point that Iglesias, Patrick Sharkey and others often point to in their defense of policing. An excellent paper by Jonathan Click and Alex Tabarrok they looked at post 9-11 terrorism alert level surges in DC police on the beat. When there were more cops on the street, they asked, did DC observe a reduction in violent crime, theft, burglary, and auto theft? On the first and most important measure, violence, Click and Tabarrok find a definitive no. They make it plain, quote, violent crime show no response to increased police presence on high alert days. Ditto for the second measure, theft, which showed no response to more policing. They found evidence of a possible impact on reduced burglaries, but at a very low threshold for statistical significance. And the intensity of the effect was also very small. So for violence, burglary, theft, no effect. And possibly a small effect, which was fairly fleeting for auto theft all of which really just confirms David Bailey's famous 1996 finding that there is no correlation between the number of police and crime rates. Apologists highlight only the effects that show that more police reduce car thefts and then spin that into a generalized defense of policing and incredibly in relationship to questions of violence. To some extent, they're replicating a tendency that is all too prevalent in peer-reviewed social science research, which is to shine a spotlight on the effect and to ignore the non-effect. But if we are really to evaluate the question, do more police on the beat reduce crime rates? Then it is important when the answer is no meaning in the unsexy language that we use as social scientists, no, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that police have no effect on crime rates. As dull as it is, this continues to show that Bailey was right. Also, these studies of police effectiveness never calculate the true costs of these police interventions. First, there are the direct financial costs. Policing is extremely expensive. Police mostly make very high salaries given the educational attainment, qualifications involved, and relative to other salaries in the jurisdictions in which they operate. They receive generous benefits, good pensions, early retirements. Most mid-career police officers in and around New York City, where I am, 
make significantly more than a tenured professor at the City University of New York, much less a licensed social worker or mental health nurse and can retire after 20 to 25 years with a half pension and full health benefits. In the aggregate, cities spend massive shares of their budgets on policing, in some cases over 40%. In New York, the total comes to around $11 billion a year when you factor, factor in pension and benefit costs, which is more than the city spends on health care, youth services, employment services, and homelessness combined. Anyone who thinks we don't overspend on policing has never looked closely at a municipal budget. Now, police defenders will point to figures that ascribe a dollar value to the lives lost to gun violence to justify the cost of policing. I think the going rate is about $5 million. And while these numbers are largely fanciful, they also fail to calculate in the costs of police violence. 7% of all homicides in the United States are committed by police. In an extreme example, police in Bakersfield, California, in the Central Valley of California, were responsible for over 20% of all homicides in that area in 2015. In addition, there is a growing body of public health research that shows that intensive policing in communities of color is directly linked to reductions in public health outcomes and life expectancies. In 2018, the American Public Health Association identified police violence as a major public health problem and recommended significant reductions to the role of police. They are abolitionists. They rejected police reform and said we need to reduce the role of police. The stress of constant police harassment and violence results in measurable negative health outcomes, even for those who are only passive observers of it. Some of this violence is unlawful and corrupt. When we, um, but others like the, the use of these gun trace task forces and gang suppression units that engage in you know horrible abuses in the name of getting the bad guys. But in fact, corruption, and in fact, corruption tends to be concentrated in exactly those units tasked with violence reduction. But much of the violence is lawful in a technical sense. We even have a term of lawful but awful to describe police use of violence. It's used to justify images of this violence, which are disturbing to watch, but police apologists insist are okay because, you know, they're legally justifiable. There are also opportunity costs in our decision to turn everything over to police. Policing works studies tend to imagine that policing is, only, is the only possible strategy that could make a difference. They never consider what alternative interventions might accomplish if funds were shifted out of policing and into community-based programs outside the criminal legal system. A, a civil rights attorney, Alec Karakitsanis, points out in a critique of police effectiveness studies, how to control crime is the wrong question and police are the wrong answer. Third, none of this should be understood as an effort to define away the problems of interpersonal violence and the very profound negative effects it has on individuals, families, and communities. We need strategies to stop the violence, both through long-term structural changes and immediate targeted interventions. Violence is not one thing. 
it takes many forms and has many underlying causes, both immediate and structural. One of the problems with police-centered approaches is that they rely on this one tool to deal with sexual assaults, intimate partner violence, youth violence, serial killers, politically motivated violence, etc. We need strategies crafted to address specific dynamics as they are experienced in specific places. We can't just come up with one abstract overview plan and then expect it to work everywhere for all problems. Domestic violence strategies in poor immigrant neighborhoods might look very different from ones in middle-class white communities. Youth violence strategies in communities with long-term intergenerational gangs will be different from strategies where young people are more isolated or their associations are more informal and fleeting. For each of these dynamics though, there exist concrete examples of programmatic interventions designed to address that harmful behavior without involving the police. Family support centers with crisis intervention teams to address domestic violence, credible messenger and trauma-informed services for youth to address youth violence, early warning systems and enhanced mental health services to prevent school shootings are just a few examples. What these interventions share is a focus on prevention. But a comprehensive approach needs to address individual level prevention, community level prevention, real time crisis response, aftercare to break the cycle of violence and long term structural changes to address to address entrenched poverty, alienation and pain at the heart of so much violence. We need strategies that look to identify those most at risk and take concrete steps to help them work through the pain and trauma that they have experienced rather than enacting it out on others. There are many approaches to this and we need more experimentation and evaluation to determine what works best under different conditions. This can include culturally appropriate trauma informed therapeutic interventions, wraparound services, social emotional behavior uh, supports, etc. Employment is key. Young people who have stable work with decent pay are very unlikely to be involved in violence. At the community level, we need to look at approaches like improved infrastructure. There's evidence that improved street lighting, better parks, widespread availability of youth services, even things like more trees are associated with lower violence. Though some of this may be a proxy for overall socioeconomic conditions. Violence interrupter programs are also crucial to provide a real-time response to outbreaks of violence. As the name indicates, these programs, also known as Cure Violence and Credible Messengers, utilize people from the community to work with young people at risk of violence as both victims and perpetrators. They respond to escalating conflicts and engaging in ongoing prevention work. They receive special training in how to de-escalate tense situations, even those involving weapons, without calling on the police or using violence themselves. When these programs are well run and well funded, they show tremendously positive results. Once the violence has occurred, we need to take steps to repair the damage and prevent the spread of violence. Gary Slutkin of the Cure Violence Movement has pointed out the ways in which communal violence spreads like a pathogen from one harmed person to another. One response is to place violence interrupters in hospitals so that when victims of violence are admitted, there is someone there to work with them as well as their friends and family to address the trauma without enacting revenge. We also need trauma-informed restorative justice approaches, like the amazing common justice program we have here in Brooklyn, which people can look up. This includes creating systems of accountability in which people who have harmed others undertake the hard work of repairing the effect of that on others 
and on themselves. But that work is best done through processes of mutual respect and understanding, not coercion and punishment. Finally, we live in a very violent society. Our government relies on systems of violence at home and abroad. Our popular culture lionizes and glorifies violence and our core political and economic systems rely on and inflict violence. The US allows almost a fifth of all children in our country to grow up in extreme poverty. We need long-term structural approaches to violence reduction rooted in the fact that violence is heavily concentrated in our poorest communities. It is young people in these groups who are most likely to be involved in interpersonal violence. The burden of this falls most heavily on these already most vulnerable communities. Universal benefits like childcare, healthcare, and income supports must be part of reducing violence. We must also come to the grips with the legacy and ongoing processes of racial discrimination, exploitation, and exclusion. This is why we must include a conversation about reparations in relationship to the history of slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing anti-Black racism, as well as the impact of settler colonialism on indigenous peoples. In this way, we can combine shorter term interventions to save lives and build a logic of care over co coercion that will open up more space for the long term task of building broader movements for racial and economic justice. Now, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list of strategies. It's merely a sampling that can be used to guide local conversations about how to move forward. This also does not rely on a framework of utilizing only evidence based initiatives, though we should include evaluation research into programmatic interventions because each intervention needs to be developed to address context specific dynamics. Therefore, we cannot limit ourselves to a few programs that have passed muster as universally successful based on quantitative analyses, which often rely on questionable methodologies. Instead, we should be informed by research that exists, but also work closely with local service providers and community leaders to hear directly from them about the effectiveness of these interventions and their potential applicability to different places. We need to include the voices of those who have been most directly affected by the criminal legal system, by systems of racial exploitation, and by the defunding of communities. But no matter what we do, there will still be interpersonal harm. We can't imagine a zero harm outcome and try to reverse engineer solutions based on that. The goal has to be to reduce harms as much as possible in terms of both the number of incidents and their impacts and to do a better job than the current system of intensive policing and mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, very insightful. Um, perhaps you could drop uh, the names of your books in the chat for anyone who is interested in uh, checking out some of your work. Um, we are now moving into the conversation part of this um, of this webinar. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions, uh, you can ask to unmute yourself and we can um, have that done. So you can ask it verbally. Otherwise, you can ask the question in the chat and I'll be happy to read that out loud. Stunned into silence. <laughs> um, to start, I would like to ask you a question while others are thinking of them. Um, 
in your book at the end of policing, um, it appears that you were very intentional about not using the word abolition. Um, can you speak to, to that and why, um, why you made that choice? And if you were to write the book now that we've had more um, abolition being used in a more um, uh, mainstream way, if you would have done something differently. Oh. It, it was it was a conscious decision. Now, the agreement with Verso to write this book and the fleshing out of the outline of it occurred uh, before the killing of Mike Brown or Eric Garner by, uh, by the police. At that time, abolitionist discourse was fairly isolated, and I had a relationship to critical resistance and some of these these organizing efforts, which were primarily focused on prison abolition. And there was very little discourse about police abolition. And my, my goal in writing the book was twofold. It was to stage an intervention in the prison abolition movement to say, hey, policing over here, we cause a lot of harm too, even when people don't go to prison. We kill people, the police, we harass them, right? We cause a lot of harm. And that needs to be part of this, a bigger part of this conversation than I felt it had been. But the other was to speak to folks on the ground in communities who experience police violence, but are caught in demands for police reform body cameras, civilian review boards, more training for implicit bias and stuff like that, which I know doesn't work. And I was like, I need to be able to talk to those folks in a language that hopefully will be accessible to them. And I felt that uh, police abolition language might be an impediment to that conversation. I don't know if I was right or not about that, but in response to your question, a new edition of the book will be out later this year, and I have a discussion quite concretely of what I think abolition means or what abolition has meant to me in my 30 years of doing this work. And so it was not because I wanna undercut that movement in any way. I, I tried very hard to write the book in a way that did not undermine or that was inconsistent with the core values of the abolitionist movement. And, and I hope that that is still true. Thank you. Um, so I'm seeing some mes messages in the chat. We have um, Mayor who writes, this was a fantastic talk, thank you. Part of the resistance to abolition or revisioning is the unions and individual police officers. What can we do to frame things so that it doesn't get a knee jerk negative reaction that group and from that group and importantly, the people who support them? Any ideas? Well, I think it's really important to make that linkage at the end that you do so nicely, Mayor, which is that we should never understand police unions as freestanding independent political entities. They are a, a locus of a whole set of deeply conservative politics, conservative homeowners associations, merchant groups, corporate interests. Look at the boards of police foundations around the country to see who these conservative interests are, right? So police unions always know that they're speaking for more than themselves and that they are in many cities they are the primary residue of deeply conservative politics. And my view is that we should not worry too much about convincing them of anything or what their reaction is gonna be. Instead, we should work to politically neutralize them by severing their relationships with politicians. And we do this by making their endorsements and political contributions politically toxic. We say to elected officials, police unions are not just another municipal union, that you should not be celebrating your relationship with them in the same way you do the teachers union. Because when teachers take political action, it's to get money for more chalk and teachers aids. 
But when police unions take action, it's to criminalize and brutalize more people in our community. And this is not the same. Ultimately, we have to go over their heads, right? I'm not trying to convince the police of anything. I'm trying to go after the elected officials who have turned every social problem under the sun over to the police to manage. And that's about working in communities to build political power so that what the police unions think just doesn't matter anymore. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Poople, um, if they would like to be unmuted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Alex. Uh, uh, fascinating talk. I really, I, I have to say I'm a police officer, but I really liked your talk. Very personal. Uh, just one query, if I may. Uh, you talked about, uh, you argued that there should be accountability, but not punishment. We should move away from a system uh, which punishes, try to punish through the police and state power. Uh, some people who may not be sympathetic to the police may still argue that we need punishment because punishment is, after all, somebody taking responsibility. So just by saying that uh, we want accountability, not punishment, and just creating maybe an artificial distinction between the two terms, uh, are we uh, making any progress here? That is my question. Thank you. L let me just say, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you're on the call and I, I hope my last statement wasn't to be interpreted as this idea that all individual officers are, are beyond hope and not and should not be part of this conversation. I have spent 30 years working with police officers all over the world and, and you know am in dialogue with them on a regular basis, but strategically, I don't think that should be the focus of the movement. And I've tried to make it very clear that this is not about demonizing police officers as individuals. Uh, while there are problems with police officers as individuals, the solution to this is not rooted in accountability as punishment of individual officer misbehavior. The, the trial going on in Minnesota, regardless of the outcome, is not going to fix policing any more than punishing some individual car thief is gonna solve the problem of car theft. Part of the problem here is this, we have this incredibly degraded notion of justice, that justice has become equated with punishment and revenge and number of years of, and, and accountability with the number of years of incarceration. And I think at the center of the abolitionist movement is a demand that we broaden our understanding of what justice is. The justice has to ultimately about, be about producing a better society for everyone. And that means that even those people who commit harm have to be understood as human beings making decisions in difficult circumstances who bear some responsibility in that moment, but who need help to make better decisions in the future. And while punishment can always point to a success here and a success there, that success is rooted in processes of humiliation and degradation. My view is we, 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 don't, we can't open all the prisons tomorrow. We can't eliminate all police tomorrow. And even if we could, I'm not sure that per se would be a good idea. What we're talking about is creating new systems that allow us to chip away at these massive infrastructures of policing and prisons. So we chip away and we see what works and we improve and we are fine and we chip away. Keep in mind that punishment mostly doesn't work very well. We have massive recidivism rates, a lot of harm that happens, so I think we need to look for something that works better than just equating accountability with punishment. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's similar um, from
from Mia. Um, could you explain the idea of criminals taking accountability a little bit more? How exactly can they help recover the damage they have caused? Also, is this approach intended to minimize putting people in prisons? Uh, the, the latter part is yes, it should redu reduce imprisonment, but also policing. So all of this is rooted in discourses around restorative justice, which I can't you know, completely reprise here in the next three minutes. But when we treat people as human beings and we understand that they're making decisions in adverse conditions, then we can try to work with them to help them make better decisions. So this means that people have to take responsibility for their actions, which actually prison doesn't require them to, right? How many people in prison are like, I didn't do it, or I was framed, or you know, I, I got a raw deal, or I was coerced, and they are not actually taking real responsibility off. Restorative justice practices ask people to really confront what's driving their harmful behavior and to do it in conversation with the people they've harmed ultimately. And that requires a kind of soul searching. Now, I certainly uh, acknowledge that not everyone can just immediately step into that process and, and find it successful and useful. So it's part of this chipping away while we enact all kinds of other prevention strategies so that people don't commit these harms in the first place. I'm seeing a question from Meki. Defund police might mean invest in social services. They are the ones responsible for family destruction, family welfare. How does this need to be reconceptualized regarding the community training of social workers? Thank you for yeah, that. Excellent. We don't want to replace armed police officers with a welfare system that polices poor people through bureaucratic and financial coercion. So I'm very sympathetic to that. Dorothy Roberts's work on the role of, of family welfare services in undermining the stability of Black families is, is excellent research that I highly recommend. I've tried to look at interventions that are rooted in community empowerment, that, pro that give primacy to community-centered interventions. So for instance, we have uh, turned mental health services over to police to manage, right? Between a quarter and a half of all people killed by police are having a mental health crisis. And the solution to that is not to expand psychiatric emergency rooms. The solution to that is to create community-based, low-barrier, peer-to-peer mental health services as a front door, or a, a, sorry, a first stop for people who need help. We don't start with doctors and pills and lock facilities, right? We, even when we have crisis intervention teams, the best models that I've seen, including the one that's being proposed here by Advocates in New York, involves peers actively engaging in crisis response. And that means peers from the same community. So I think this is essential. Uh, Forrest Stewart in his work down out and under arrest in Los Angeles talks about the homelessness services archipelago and the way that it's rooted in this idea of neoliberal individual responsibility that just is about managing people and not really helping them. You know, people don't need temporary and transitional housing. They need permanent housing, which is almost never what's on offer with these services. So we need to be clear about what it is we're really demanding. Um, some attendees would like to know, um, can you tell me where I can find David Bailey quote about how more police don't. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't. He's written so many things. It's from 1996. So try, just Google David Bailey 1996. And even that quote, you know, police, you know, increasing police doesn't reduce crime. Uh, and it'll pop right up. I'm sorry, I don't remember uh, which book it's in. It's also in the first chapter of my book, there is an end note, I think, with the specific page number. And I don't seem to have a copy of my book sitting here in front of me, 
So, uh, sorry. Great. Um, additionally, um, someone would like to know if you could share the names of people you cited in this talk. Um, they would like to read their work as well. Um, so if you would be able to put those in the chat, that would be fantastic. Yes, and, and all of this is going to be also in the second edition of the book, which will be out in the fall. But I'll try to throw a few in the chat in a second. It's hard for me to answer questions and, and type that stuff in. Yes, um, and then I believe Michael would like to speak. Can we unmute Michael? Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Alex. Uh, Michael Coyle, thank you very much for your fantastic talk. I had a question that was as follows. The step before policing is law. After all, police are called law enforcement. When we talk about penal abolition, I always think of the criminalizing system. And the first step of the criminalizing system is actually the writing of the law. Law, police. Michael, I lost you. Is that? Yeah, Michael, it appears that you're. OK, but I, I think I got the gist of the question, which is, what is the role of legal frameworks in understanding this? So I, I was alluding to that in this discussion about how we frame what counts as violent crime. So certain kinds of harmful behavior is treated as street crime to be suppressed by policing and incarceration, while other harmful behavior is rewarded with multi-million dollar salaries and stock buyback programs and executive compensation plans, right? So the law does not exist to provide universal protection from harm. The law exists protect systems of exploitation. So there's a famous 19th century saying, the law in its majesty forbids both the rich and the poor from sleeping under bridges, stealing bread and begging in the streets. But of course, the rich don't need to do these things, only the poor do. And you know, the whole legal framework around the war on drugs was created to produce racial inequality. So we don't need to give narcotics units anti-bias training to fix that. We need to eliminate that legal framework of the war on drugs. So I hope that was helpful. And thank you uh, for putting the Bailey thing, Police for the Future is the book. Uh, someone put it in the chat. Thank you. Great. Um, we have time for a few more questions here. Um, from, the, from an attendee, we have your comments seem critical of conservatives for defending oppressive institutions. Do progressives, modern, moderate liberals, neoliberals, the center left also deserve some criticism for supporting carceral policies? And how do, how do abolitionists engage with both communities? Absolutely. I'm, I tried to also allude to this in my commentary about the way in which big city mayors of both political parties are invested in creating social problems and then turning them over to police and prisons to manage. So, so neoliberal austerity is a bipartisan project. And, and it, this is not at all partisan. Yeah, so liberalism persists in this myth that the police just neutrally enforce the law and the law benefits everyone when in reality, police produce an order that is rooted in exploitation and inequality. And liberals are fully invested in that process. They just kowtow to this ideology that the police should be more professional and race neutral, while Republicans largely dispense with this and say, well, you deserve the violence that it's enacted upon. But both of them are creating these massive systems of inequality. Thank you. Um, Sarah writes, you talk about the need for long-term structural change, but a lot of this discuss discussion seems to center on individual responsive 
rehabilitation, accountability, and enabling criminalized persons and police officers with making better choices. But how do the intervention you're talking about take state violence accountability into account? Okay, I think partly what's going on here is that there's this uh, discourse that says, well, we can't fix violence and we can't fix crime until we completely like end capitalism and transform society. And what I'm trying to add to that conversation is we don't have to end capitalism before we can substantively address these questions. But we should not confuse our ability to engage in immediate substantive interventions with the same thing as long-term structural transformation. So that's why I tried to say we need interventions at all of these levels. And part of why this is important in my view is that our failure as a movement for transformative change to directly address interpersonal harms in working class communities undermines our ability to build a radical working class movement because fear of crime and violence drives people to the right and is always harnessed by authoritarians to gin up support for an ideology of punitiveness. So we have to counteract that ideology by saying, no, we can care for our community members, our family members, while we work for these bigger changes. And in fact, as we win victories in the immediate moment, we, for, you know, we, we presage of what real transformative change could look like. I, I, I don't think it's inconsistent to say that individuals make decisions in difficult circumstances and can play a role in changing those harmful behaviors with adequate supports and saying we need broad structural changes. I mean, when, 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 you, when you work with young people, when you work in communities that experience a lot of this stuff, these are people, individuals making decisions and they need help. They don't need punishment, but they also don't need to be told, well, there's nothing we can do until we have the revolution. Fantastic, thank you. Um, maybe with our last few minutes, um, I'm not quite seeing any more questions. Um, we do have a comment um, that is a statement saying, in Portland, Oregon, on emergency calls, you can insist slash ask that a mental health advocate go out first or with police and that police not respond until that person arrives. If the call is based in mental health or the person needing help has mental health issues. But it would be great if cops were not the first responders for things like heart attacks and fires and abolished altogether. We already don't need them on most emergency calls. People are reluctant to call an ambulance because they know or worry cops might also show up. Uh, Portland has PSR, Portland Street Response, a start to a non-police responses. Could you give a few um, words uh, or reflection on that comment? You know, uh, yes, this is what we're talking about, is systematically replacing policing with systems of, of care. Now, we need to do this in ways that don't reproduce a, a coercive welfare state. So we should prioritize interventions that are community centered and community accountable. Uh, but yes, getting police out of the mental health business, getting them out of the schools, getting them out of the drug business, getting them out of the sex work business, getting them out of the homelessness business. This is how we dismantle carceralism in my view. One step at a time, rooted in concrete interventions. It's not through sentencing reform, it's not through parole reform. It's not even through bail reform, in my view, by itself. In my view, we have to dismantle the system of policing. 
Fantastic. Thank you. I'd like to give a huge thanks to Alex Vitali, um, as well as our incredible ASL interpreters, uh, Rarity and Jaron. Um, I would like to encourage everyone everyone to see the link um, that was just sent to the attendees where you can um, give us feedback um, and remind everyone that we also have conference critiques um, that are available um, this, uh, this evening if you'd like to join us for that. And our next keynote event will be here in just a few minutes. But thank you everyone, a big round of applause.